Good morning. Welcome to Zion Lutheran Church this morning in Torrance, California for our virtual worship service. It is Sunday, February 7th, 2021. Here at Zion, we are still celebrating the Epiphany season. Epiphany is a word which means to reveal or to make manifest. And during this time of Epiphany, the scriptures reveals to us Jesus in many different ways. And today, our theme will be that Jesus reveals himself in our suffering. As even in our suffering, Jesus reveals himself to us as he gives us assurances to get us through the suffering of this world, which we all go through. May God bless us today as we consider this theme so that we gain strength in our faith to suffer willingly for Jesus and to be able to know that that suffering even has a good purpose in our lives. May the Lord bless us now as we worship together according to the order of service that's printed for you in your worship folder. If you are a guest who has joined us through our website, there is a link there also for you to click so that you can get a PDF of our worship service and you'll be able to follow along more easily. Let's begin our worship then with our opening hymn, number 429, What God Ordains is Always Good. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us 
forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for all of our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you sent your one and only Son as the word of life for our eyes to see and our ears to hear. Help us to believe what the scriptures proclaim about him and do the things that are pleasing in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We now give our careful attention to the Word of God as he's caused it to be written for us in the pages of Holy Scripture, beginning with a lesson from the Old Testament, the book of Job, chapter 7, verses 1 to 7. If you know anything about the story of Job, you know that Job was a faithful believer in God. He had done no particular sin that would have led God to punish him. And yet God gave permission to Satan to do harm in his life. And Satan took advantage of that and took all of his possessions away and then took his health away as well. As you can imagine, Job was under a great duress. And he writes words that tell us of what's going on in his heart as this difficult life that's come upon him takes its toll. And we can kind of relate to what Job is going through. And as we do, let's also remember what Job says at the very end that our God does remember these things, and he is a compassionate and merciful God. We read, Do not mortals have hard service on earth? Are not their days like those of hired laborers, like a slave longing for the evening shadows, or a hired laborer waiting to be paid? So I have been allotted months of futility, and nights of misery have been assigned to me. When I lie down, I think, how long before I get up? The night drags on, and I toss and turn until dawn. My body is clothed with worms and scabs. My skin is broken and festering. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle, and they come to an end without hope. Remember, O God, that my life is but a breath. My eyes will never see happiness again. Here ends our first lesson from God's Word. Our second lesson for today is recorded for us in Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 28 to 30. And these words will serve as the basis of our meditation on God's Word in just a few moments. Paul writes, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. This ends our second lesson from God's Word. 
our verse for today. Alleluia. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel for this day is recorded for us in the Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 1, beginning with the 29th verse. Glory be to you, O Lord. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Here ends the Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to you, O Christ. We join together now in confessing our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed printed for you in your worship folder. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten from the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We continue our service with the singing of our next hymn, our hymn of the day, Hail to the Lord's Anointed, number 93.
Dear friends in Christ, Horatio Gates Spafford. Do you recognize that name? He is the author of the last hymn that we're going to sing today. It's called When Peace Like a River. Or as many people know it, It Is Well With My Soul. Horatio Spafford lived in the mid-1800s to late-1800s. He was a lawyer and a successful businessman in Chicago. He was also a devout Christian and a leader of his church. In the late part of 1870, Horatio Spafford's four-year-old son contracted scarlet fever and died, leaving him and his wife, Anna, with just four young daughters. In spring of 1871, Anna and Horatio invested heavily in real estate along the shoreline of Chicago. In the fall of 1871, the great fire of Chicago broke out, and Anna and Horatio lost almost all of their investments. Two years later, Horatio decided that it would be good for his family to take a little vacation and go across the seas to England. And so he booked passage on a steamer called the Ville de Havre. He, however, was not able to go when that ship sailed because of business responsibilities. And so he sent his family ahead and planned to go himself a few days later. On November 22nd, of 1873, the Ville de Havre collided with an English sailing ship, and in 12 minutes, it sank. His four daughters all perished at sea. His wife was rescued. She was clinging unconscious to a plank in the ocean, and they took her to Wales, and when she reached there, she wired back a simple message to her husband, saved alone. What shall I do? Horatio immediately booked passage on another ship to sail and get his wife. But as he was crossing the ocean, the captain of that ship were told let him know when they were over the place where the Ville de Havre had sunk. And it's reported that then he went into his stateroom and he wrote the words of the hymn that we're going to sing today. But that's not all. A few years later, Anna and Horatio had three more children, two daughters and a son. When he was three or four years old, that second son also contracted scarlet fever and died. In Romans chapter 8, verse 18, Paul writes, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. When I hear about sufferings like those of men like Horatio Spafford and the Apostle Paul and so many others, I can only imagine that their faith must have allowed them to envision an awful great glory in heaven. But it's not just the Job-like sufferers of this world who need comfort and encouragement when our life is filled with trials and tragedies and sorrows and pains. We all suffer them. We have our own sufferings, our own sorrows that we all go through, which often give rise to a silent question inside of us, Why, Lord? A child shouldn't die before its parents. It makes no sense that a couple who has made it to retirement and are planning to retire and enjoy some time together should suddenly have one of that couple pass away, leaving the other couple to years of loneliness. It doesn't make sense that a healthy, young father would catch COVID and suddenly be gone, die just like that, leaving four young children and a mother all to themselves. Why do we hear sometimes that young people, young men, young women end up contracting MS or Parkinson's disease? Why is it that some families' houses burn down to the ground? 
Why is it that there are some accidents where both parents are killed, leaving a very tiny little child without parents? The Apostle Paul defends his words that the sufferings like those are not worth comparing with the glory of in heaven by reminding us believers of something that we know. Two things that we know, in fact. The first thing is that though we are sometimes dumbfounded by the pain and suffering that we go through and the tragedies of our life, so that we don't even know what we can pray to God, we don't even have the ability to form the words in our minds and our hearts, that first of all then we know that the Holy Spirit of God intercedes for us with unspoken groans that the Father understands and that are fitting with his will for us. And the second thing that we know is what Paul writes to us in our text for today. We know, Paul says, that God works in all things for the good of those who love him, for our good. Take note, first of all, as you hear those words, that Paul is not saying that this promise applies to everyone everywhere. For he has placed a limitation upon it. And that limitation is even more emphatic in the original language because of the word order where Paul brings that one phrase way up to the front of this statement. He says, for those who love God, God works all things for their good. And who are those who love God? They are the believers. They are those who love God because, as Scripture says, God has first loved them and saved them, and so they love God. They are the believers. And Paul defines them a little bit more when he says, those who are the called according to his purpose or according to his plan. God has called these people to faith through the gospel. And he's done that, Paul says, according to his plan, a plan which God made already in eternity, where he chose them and then called them to be believers through his gospel message. And I said a few moments ago that God works all things for our good. And when I say our, dear friends, I'm assuming that you are believers in Jesus Christ because that's who these promises are for. They aren't for unbelievers. Those who don't believe in Jesus, those who don't believe in God, those who worship other gods, those who even call themselves Christians but continue to walk in the darkness, these promises are not for them. They are for believers. Should we at believers then expect that everything that happens in our life should be good? Should we say that it's good when a child gets cancer and dies? Should we say that it's good when somebody is in a terrible accident and the rest of their life they are paralyzed? Should we say that it's good when somebody loses their job and their house and has to live from hand to mouth in a, living in a car? We need to be careful here, dear friends, because God is not the cause of evil. What's behind all of that is the devil. And a world which is broken because of the consequences of sin that have come into this world. Those things are bad. They are evil. And they are the consequences of a sinful world that's broken because sin came into it. And they are the consequences of the direct action sometimes of Satan who is trying to harm the people of this world. We read from Job a little bit earlier today. And what we can learn from Job is that Satan was out to destroy Job's faith. He was trying through hurting him in his life to get him to deny Jesus, to deny God. But what we also learn from the book of Job is that even though he isn't the cause or source of evil, that sometimes in his wisdom, God allows Satan to bring evil into people's lives. 
And yet that also tells us that Satan has no power, no ability, except for that which God gives them. And that's often what brings up in our hearts and our minds that cry from us, why God? I don't understand. How can you let this happen? But that's where the Apostle Paul then comes and comforts us today because he gives us this wonderful truth that for those who love him, God works all things for our good. That includes the evil. That includes the bad. That includes the things that Satan does as he tries to take us away from God. God is not the cause of the suffering and the tragedies of his believers. But he uses those things for his purpose and for our good. Now what is that good? And how is it that God accomplishes that good in our lives? Well, we might be mistaken about what we think is good. You see, when we think of good, we think of a life that's free of pain and tragedy, a life full of ease. We think of good as being successful and prosperous in our lives. We think of good as being full of health and good days. But God's good isn't necessarily that good. In fact, Jesus once said, what good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world? and yet loses his soul. The good that God has in mind for us is good for our soul. And the Apostle Paul expresses that when he says, this is the good God has in mind for us. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Once again, Paul amazes us by telling us that before the world was created, before we were ever in existence, God knew us and he had a plan for us. And that plan was that we would be conformed to the likeness, to the image of his son. Now, in what way would we be like Jesus? In what way would we be conformed to his likeness? Paul tells us that in Colossians when he says, that God is going to transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Who will be transformed in that way? It's believers. Those who have been redeemed by Jesus and who believe in the forgiveness of sins that he has gained for them. And in what way will they be transformed? The pain and the suffering and the, the weakness of this world will be transformed into the glory of heaven, into a perfect, glorious body like our Savior's. And Paul adds to that in 1 Corinthians 15 when he tells us about that body and he says it's going to be an immortal body, imperishable body, incorruptible body, a perfect, strong body. This is the good that God intends to bring us by working all things for our good, our eternal good, the good of the glory of heaven. And Paul then punctuates how God is going to accomplish this in our life by listing those things for us that God is doing. He predestined us. He called us. He justified us. He glorified us. Notice that in all of these things, each step of the way, God is the one who is working out his purpose and working out his plan in our lives. We may not comprehend that plan. We may not understand it. We may even question God's wisdom in that plan. But Paul says this is true. It is the word and promise of God. And the goal of his working in our life is glory. We don't experience that glory right now. We don't see it, but we hope for it. We know it's coming in heaven. And until then, we have this assurance that all that's happening in our life, everything, all things, God is working. He's making them serve our good, that glory. And why? 
because of Jesus. Because of Jesus, he declares us to be innocent before him. Because of Jesus, he has called us to faith in the gospel. Because of Jesus, he declares that we are his own dear children. And for Jesus' sake, he will take us to heaven where we will be in that glory with him for eternity. And God even uses the terrible things that happened to Jesus to advance this plan. It was not good for the Jews and the leaders of the Jews to lie and to blaspheme God as they found a way to condemn Jesus to death. It was not good for Judas to follow the temptations of Satan and turn Jesus over, betray him, his Lord and his friend. It was not good for Pontius Pilate to be so weak-kneed that the fear of the mob that was before him caused him to condemn an innocent man in a travesty of justice. It was not good that this innocent man should have been beaten beyond reason and then crucified as one of the most worst of the one of the most worst criminals ever. But this is the way God worked for us to accomplish his goal in our lives. He saved the world through that evil. He made it so that Jesus could suffer the suffering we deserved and die our death through that evil. Who would have known? No one. Unless and until God revealed it to us through the gospel message. And so also, who would have known or who could have guessed that through the pain and suffering of our lives, God is working, driving us back to Jesus, causing us to call to Jesus for help, causing us to hope in Jesus and planning to bless us with eternal glory through that suffering. Who would have known? No one except that God, through the Apostle Paul, has revealed it to us today. Horatio Spafford <clears throat> wrote the verses of this hymn that we're going to sing at the end of our service today. But there were two verses that our hymn book does not include, and I'd like to share those with you. <clears throat> they go like this. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul. For me, be it Christ, be it Christ hence to live, if Jordan above me shall roll, no pain shall be mine, for in death as in life. Thou wilt whisper thy peace to my soul. It is well with my soul. This is what God wants for us through the pains and the suffering and the tragedy of our lives. He wants us to run to Jesus. He wants us to trust in Jesus. He wants us to find our peace in Jesus who gave his life for us. And then he, through Jesus, will heal our souls. And he will give encouragement to us so that we can continue to serve him in the midst of pain and suffering in this life. And then, as he's promised us, one day, all of this suffering, he will guide so that it serves us and so that we obtain that glory which he has prepared for us to be conformed 
to the likeness of his son, our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Having heard this wonderful word of our God, it's our opportunity to offer him our thanksgiving. And we do that, first of all, through our offering as indicated in your worship folder. And you can give him thanks by mailing in an offering to the church or also uh, sending it through the Zelle app electronically. We also give him thanks and honor him with our offering of our prayers, which we will do next following our general prayer of the church. I invite you to pray the Lord's Prayer with me as printed for you in your worship folder. Let us now offer the Lord our prayer. O Lord Jesus, you who came down from your glory in heaven to suffer in this world for our sake, you who were afflicted during your life here by temptations of Satan again and again, and by the punishment and torture of men. Yet, O oh Lord, you did that because through that you were earning for us our salvation. And we give you thanks and praise for your willingly keep God's will for you, and that through this terrible evil that we see in this world, yet you saved us. You are our magnificent Savior, O oh Lord. And you rose again to receive the glory, to remind us that after the cross, after the tragedy, after the suffering, there is in store for us glory because of what you have done for us. We ask you to prepare us for that day through trusting in you and turning away from our own thoughts and our own minds and trusting only your promises as you give them to us in your word, even though it, it doesn't seem to make sense to us. And so, Lord, as we suffer in this world, as we suffer losses of loved ones, as we suffer illnesses and sicknesses and diseases in this world, even like COVID-19, help us, through your word, to be able to endure, to wait patiently for the day when our cross is replaced by glory, and to willingly carry that cross now, knowing that you have made our cross easy and light because you have redeemed us to be God's very own, loved always, beloved by you always. We pray especially for those in our congregation right now, O oh Lord, who are suffering crosses of various kinds, whether it be mental crosses that cause depression and loneliness, or whether it be physical ailments that are causing them pain and suffering, or whether it is the loss of a loved one, be with them, O oh Lord, and give them your comfort and assure them that even though these things are evil, they are bad, yet in your amazing grace, you work out good for us through them, and they can trust that. We pray, O oh Lord, also that you would be with our nation, especially in this next week, as again we are fearful of things that might happen. O oh Lord, calm the hearts of many people, that they realize that pain and suffering is not a way to solve differences but that through talking and listening to one another, we can love one another and show our kindness for one another. Give our government officials the ability to rule in fairness and honesty so that the people may be blessed through the government that you have placed over us. Keep us, O Lord, safe so that we may continue to proclaim your name to the ends of the earth. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior, and also we join to pray as he has taught us, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.
Amen. We conclude our service now with the singing of our final hymn, When Peace Like a River, number 760 in Christian Worship Supplement. You might also be interested to know that the tune that was written for this hymn was named by the author of the tomb, Vil du Havre, after the ship that sank. And the name means, in French, City of Refuge. Thank you for joining us for this worship service today, virtual though it is. We pray that God blesses you through the words that you have heard of his gospel message. Special reminder to the members of Zion that you would take a look at the announcements for you in our worship folder and click on some of the new links that are there. Some new videos are available for you to watch and keep abreast of what's going on in our synod, the Wisconsin Synod. Two reminders about things coming in the coming week. One is our Wednesday evening virtual Bible class. Please join us for that. Uh, many of you have been doing that. We invite others who haven't had a chance to do that to do that again. This will be our last Bible class until after Easter because the next Wednesdays after that will be our Lent meditation services. And also a reminder to the ladies of our congregation that the ladies' virtual tea will be on Tuesday or on, sorry on Saturday at two o'clock. And if you need help connecting with that, please contact Mary Jo Barnes. Those are our announcements for today. Until we meet again, may the Lord be with you.